the session we had last week, which uh, two weeks ago, which I hope many of you joined for, was really great. And that may be the reason you're back this week. And uh, we'll look forward to two weeks from now when Cantor Rosenberg speaks about Yiddish music. But tonight we- He's gonna sing. He's gonna <laughs> sing, okay. Even better, even better. Um, tonight we have uh, the session broken into uh, two major parts plus a few other smaller items that Terry has. Uh, the first is that we want to help you to learn more about the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, which you may or may not know about, and you may or may not have been on their website, but I would urge you to uh, consider looking. And um, we have a person, Krista Whitney, from the Yiddish Book Center with us. And then uh, Cantor Ken Richmond and Rob Shira Shazir uh, are from Natick and they are going to be speaking about how they are living a Yiddish life and uh, living Yiddish at home and uh, sounds uh, pretty different than the way I live. And so um, sort of a shameless plug for the Yiddish Book Center. My wife just finished a session on Mahjong that went from seven to eight o'clock. And um, I, I think if you take a second to look at it, you'll find it quite interesting. Uh, so let me just mention a little bit, Krista Whitney is with us. She is the director of the Wexler Oral History Project, which has more than 1,000 videos, the interviews about Yiddish language and culture with people of many ages and backgrounds. She came from Northern California and became interested in studying Yiddish when she was studying comparative literature at Smith College and studied Yiddish at the Vilnius Yiddish Institute and the Yiddish Book Center and for the last 10 years has traveled near and far in search of Yiddish stories, gaining skills in filmmaking and video production and archival preservation. And um, there are two things that she has been working on and is working on. One is a documentary that uh, she'll talk about and the other is an upcoming presentation on November 5th at 7 p.m for which you can sign up at the Yiddish Books, YiddishBookCenter.org. And it is coming to America, Jewish Immigrant Stories of Encounter and Adaptation. So if this uh, is an interesting topic, I think you'll find that equally well. So I wanna introduce everyone to Krista Whitney from the Yiddish Book Center. And uh, Krista has some remarks to talk about uh, their mission, their history and their future and her work there. So uh, Krista, if you would, um, thank you for being with us. Shalom Aleichem. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's always uh, fun to connect with people, particularly in this time when I feel like meeting new people is uh, not really a part of our lives <laughs> so much. Um, uh, it used to be in normal times that I was traveling around a lot, uh, meeting people as part of my work to interview them for the oral history project. And um, I really miss that. So um, it's great to be here with you all tonight. And thanks to Stan and Terry for bringing me on. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of information about the Yiddish Book Center where I work and um, talk a bit about its history and what we're up to now in case it will be of interest to any of you. So the Yiddish Book Center has a pretty dramatic story, I think engaging story of how it was um, founded. So 40 years ago in 1980, there was a young graduate student by the name of Aaron Lansky who was studying Yiddish literature up at McGill in Montreal and uh, he was studying Yiddish literature, but the problem was that they weren't always able to find uh, books for their assignments. So they would get, you know, they'd be assigned, you can imagine this, you're assigned your homework, and this, the few students that were in the program would sort of race each other to the library to see who could get, you know, the one copy of the book that was uh, at the library. And, um, and then the other students maybe had to go to one of the old Jewish bookstores in town, try to figure out how to find a copy of the reading. Um, and so Aaron decided, well, I know that people have books. I mean, the books exist. So 
he started putting up these signs around the city saying, you know, students looking for Yiddish books. And they were, they started to get some calls. And in fact, they started to get a lot of calls. Um, so many uh, calls that eventually Aaron decided to drop out of graduate school and make this collection of Yiddish books a full-time job. Um, there, you know, it was a time when people had these Yiddish books. Many people had brought Yiddish books with them as they came from Europe to, to North America. And, um, and, you know, as I'm sure many of you know, you know, one term for the Jewish people is the, the people of the book. And these Yiddish books were really valued um, treasures by uh, many of the people who were giving Aaron um, these, their books. Um, and, but it was also a time of a, of a generational shift. So people who had cherished these Yiddish books, their kids maybe weren't so interested in them. Um, you know, maybe they hadn't taught their kids Yiddish, so their kids couldn't read them. They didn't really have a use for these books and didn't understand their value. So in the early days when uh, Aaron Lansky and his uh, fellow uh, volunteers, uh, mostly, but some, some paid staff people as well, were going around, they were sometimes literally finding these books in dumpsters. I mean, there's dramatic stories of getting called, uh, you know, and racing down to New York and fishing Yiddish books out of dumpsters before the rainstorm starts. I mean, it's really um, quite an amazing story that uh, the first decade or more of the Yiddish Book Center was really all about this. And since then, um, over the Yiddish Book Center has collected over 1 million Yiddish books. And many of those books are uh, in now in Western Massachusetts, where the Yiddish Book Center is located in Amherst. Uh, but many of them have also, the idea was never to just, you know, hoard these books. So right away there was it, actually the original name of the center was the Yiddish Book Exchange. The idea was, you know, to, to get the books back out to people who might read them. So the Yiddish Book Center provided uh, libraries, university libraries, synagogue libraries, community libraries all around the world really with Yiddish books. Um, and early on, so in the 90s when it really wasn't uh, the late 90s when it really wasn't so common as it is now the Yiddish Book Center decided well not everyone's going you know we can't ship these books necessarily to everyone who wants them so what if we digitize them and er, and the Yiddish Book Center digitized over 20,000 different titles of Yiddish books and made them available to everyone online for free. And I'm going to share my screen now to just show you uh, the result of that work. So this is the Yiddish Book Center's website. And you can see up here at the top that there are several different sections of the website. If you go over to digital collection, library and collections, you'll see the this website really is a repository of really valuable uh, primary sources and archival materials. So this first uh, button here will take you to over 11,000 titles of Yiddish um, literature that are available to read. If you, if any of you know, can read Yiddish. Uh, recorded programs, other archival recordings. If some of you, it's some of you might know, understand Yiddish, but not be able to read it, you could listen to some Yiddish audiobooks. Um, and then listed here as well is the project that I'm in charge of at the Yiddish Book Center, which is the Oral History Project. If you click in here, you can 
see all kinds of different videos. You can search the collection if you're interested in a particular place or person, you can search. Um, you can also uh, look up someone's name by their last name to see if we've interviewed them. So the Yiddish Book Center is a, it's sort of, it's not a museum, but it is a museum and it's also a nonprofit and an educational organization as well. So, and an archive. So we have all these materials, but we knew from the beginning that not everyone was gonna learn Yiddish. Um, we do offer some educational programs to learn Yiddish, um, but we also offer educational programs for high school students, college students, um, and adults. The idea is how can we open up these books literally through doing the digitization, but also metaphorically, how can we educate people about the culture that these books and this literature represents? So if you're interested, there's a bunch of adult programs um, and programs for high school students and college students, as I mentioned. And then uh, we also have a bunch of really interesting articles. We have a podcast called The Schmooze, where we interview people um, doing interesting work in the Yiddish world and the Jewish cultural world. And, um, and we also have over here virtual events. So um, Stan mentioned that I'm giving a talk next week about, so this is the program that happened tonight. And next week I'll be giving a talk about Jewish immigrant stories of encounter and adaptation. So if, if you wanna hear more about Jewish immigrant stories from our oral history project, you can join me next week. And then finally, I wanted to tell you all about an exciting new initiative that uh, we have started. So I said that the Yiddish Book Center began in 1980. That means that it's been 40 years. And so as a part of our 40th, uh, we launched a program that is going to tfu, 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 uh, last the next decade. Um, so every year we're going to have a theme around which we'll do a series of programs. So this past year, of course, it being 2020, a lot of what we had planned had to be canceled. But um, this year, the theme was Yiddish in America, culture and cultural encounters. Um, and actually, we haven't announced what we're doing next year, but uh, that will be coming up soon. So that is just the very quick history of the Yiddish Book Center and a bit about uh, what we're doing now. I encourage you to explore this website. If you're interested in staying in touch with us, we have now a weekly email where you get you can get curated content from Aaron Lansky from the various things on our website and in our collections, which you can sign up for right here at yiddishbookcenter.org. So I will stop sharing. And was that everything that I was supposed to cover, Stan and Terry? That's sort of a speed tour. You, you, did, you did a great job. And thank <laughs> you so much for that. Do we have time for one or two questions, perhaps, before we, uh, we move along? Who has a question out there? Type it in the chat if you do, or um, you know, or Sam can pick it up and repeat it. Anybody have questions that they'd like to put out there? Big oh, smile, well, Krista, thank you. Well, I see <laughs> Maida Ma Ma has a question, yeah. so go ahead, okay. Maida. Yeah, I sent a couple of them actually into Krista. So the, they're just very nitty gritty, um, these wonderful programs that you're doing. Any chance you're recording them? So the oh, yeah, we've been doing them since the spring and they're all recorded and on okay. the website. So if you uh, go to that virtual programs section of the website, you'll also see all the recordings. Great. And I see you also wanted me to mention, which I'm glad you reminded me that um, to hear- I'm a more, librarian. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> to hear more about the early years of the Yiddish Book Center, I highly recommend Aaron's memoir called Outwitting History. It's a great read. 
all about the adventures of uh, rescuing Yiddish books. Um, yeah. Hey. Wonderful play. Thank you. All right. Well, hey, that's anybody it. else? Right. Joni, is that a question? No. All right. Cheryl? Yeah. Um, what? How many people would you say are reading, speaking Yiddish <laughs> these days? I'm, I'm really not the person to ask about statistics. Um, so I'm going to not answer that question. Maybe the next people who are presenting will have an answer to that, but I really don't know. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's hard, in a way, it's hard to document. It's not something that is necessarily collected in a census, for example, or, you know, in any um, organized way. And there are a lot of people who know some of the language. I mean, I think the majority of the population where Yiddish is spoken today would be within the Haredi communities, the ultra-Orthodox communities. But as you're about to hear in the next part of tonight's program, there are other people who speak Yiddish still to this day. Krista, before we um, transition, one question came up on the screen. Is there music on the Yiddish Book Center website? Um, there is not much music. You know, there is another organization out of Florida Atlantic University that is all about collecting Yiddish music. So we don't overlap with them. So that's a great resource for, for Yiddish music over there. And we'll, we'll learn more in two weeks from Cantor Rosenberg. <laughs> so, all right, Krista, thank you so much for taking time this evening to be with us. And I think Terry wants to uh, pick up from here. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Krista. It was great. Um, I could just say that, that uh, since we had our last session, it just seems to me that Yiddish is exploding all over the place. Every time you turn on the TV, I picked up my local town newspaper, um, which had the word, you know, for Brent in it. And uh, grandmothers, every conversation seems to have at least one Yiddish word, you know, um, and it's not necessarily um, within a Jewish context. So uh, Yiddish is out there. Um, I'm looking at the screen and I know I can see on the first screen, I know two people who speak Yiddish fluently um, who are with us tonight. So, uh, and now we're gonna hear a totally different um, conversation with uh, Cantor Ken Richmond from Temple Israel of Natick and Rabbi Shira Shazir, who is the rabbi at Metro West Jewish Day School in um, Framingham, I think it is. And uh, Ken actually grew up at Temple Emanuel. Maybe he'll throw in a little history there for us. Um, he is currently not only a cantor, but he's getting his rabbinical degree from Hebrew College um, within a year. And Shira got her degree at Hebrew College, correct? And um, they are currently raising, they have three sons, and they are currently raising them by speaking Yiddish at home. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken and Shira and let them take it away. We're so glad you're with us. Great to be with you guys. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks so much for having us. Great to be back at Temple Israel. I mean, excuse okay. me, Temple Emmanuel, <laughs> even if only um, in the online forum. And uh, thank you so much to Krista. We're big fans of the Yiddish Book Center and we've, we've made several trips there and we have many of the books around our house. And we've also um, downloaded many books, uh, including you know, translations of Treasure Island and Dr. Doolittle that we've read with our kids at night. Um, so I think um, maybe we'll start by both sharing some of our Yiddish story, how we came to speak Yiddish. Uh, maybe I'll let Shira begin. Oh, I get to begin. Okay. <laughs> um, great. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Good to see you all. Um, so let's see. Um, I guess uh, Yiddish probably started, a, I started to get a little bit of Yiddish as a kid. Uh, for a little while there, my dad had a plan that he was going to speak a different language every day of the week. Um, it was going to be Yiddish one day and Hebrew another day and French one day, Spanish one day. I think he thought that he might learn Japanese. Um, and um, I'm the second child. In, in the family and my brother, who's like four years older than me, uh, turned out to have a really great talent in math. 
um, before I got around to learning all of the languages. And it turned out that my dad could only talk about math and English. Um, so <laughs> while I didn't get Yiddish a, a full day a week, um, I would occasionally find that, you know, my dad was only speaking Yiddish for a few hours and, uh, and would insist on speaking to us and, and asking for things and demanding things until someone figured out what he was talking about. So um, I didn't get exactly fluency that way, but the sound of the language, um, the sound of the language I did get in some vocabulary. Um, all of my grandparents spoke Yiddish, usually not directly to any of us, but um, and in fact, once I learned Yiddish, um, when I would occasionally try to speak with my grandmother in Yiddish, she something in her brain wouldn't let her speak to me in Yiddish. She, she would answer in English, um, in her heavily accented English. Um, so got a little bit at home. Um, eventually started uh, singing with a klezmer band, doing a lot of Yiddish um, singing, and got a lot of, of um, more vocabulary, greater sense of um, familiarity with the language through song, which is a great way to learn any language. Um, eventually we took some classes together um, and decided that, uh, that Yiddish would be an important part of our lives. Is that mostly what you wanted me to say? That sounds good. Okay, great. What, do you want um, to talk? Sure, I'll talk. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, one of the Oriel Weinreich Yiddish textbook begins with a section about how you know, Yid Yidden read in Yiddish and Allah Lender, the, the Jews speak Yiddish in all the lands in Mexico and Russia and in, in America, et cetera. And, and millions of Jews uh, speak Yiddish, you know, which uh, isn't quite the case anymore. But as, as Krista said, you know, there's a, a large Yiddish speaking population among the Hasidim, uh, especially certain sects. Uh, some sects learn it more um, you know, when they go off to yeshiva. Uh, others, you know, make that the primary language at home. Uh, besides that, there's, of course, you know, the older generation that, that grew up speaking Yiddish, which uh, unfortunately is diminishing. And then there's the Yiddishists by choice, which among uh, which uh, we include ourselves. Uh, um, so I grew up with, uh, I didn't have Yiddish in, in the immediate household, but I heard some from my grandparents. Uh, my Zeta was born in Ukraine and came over when he was five years old. And... Uh, you know, he and his wife, uh, my grandmother, went back to Yiddish you know, later on in life, and they took uh, classes in Yiddish and wrote stories and poems. Um, he, he would write sometimes limericks in Yiddish, or uh, he wrote a version of the, um, I think, the preamble to the U.S. Constitution, a Yiddish version of that. Um, and, uh, and I remember their, their jokes, which often had Yiddish punchlines as well. Um, so I also you know, came to Yiddish through uh, playing klezmer music and singing Yiddish songs. Uh, and going, we used to go to a klez camp, a Yiddish cultural festival in the Catskills that was over Christmas each year uh, and get a, a flavor of Yiddish there. And then I think we started, uh, both of us learning Yiddish for uh, seriously uh, during when we were studying in Israel and took classes uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And then a year or two later, we took, um, we spent the summer in the, uh, at the time, the Columbia YIVO summer program, which was a real Yiddish immersion program where you took classes and grammar and drama and music uh, all in Yiddish. And we were all encouraged to only speak Yiddish to each other the whole time. And then um, I guess uh, a few years went by and um, we didn't speak as much Yiddish for a few years until we had children. Maybe I'll let you tell this part of the story. Okay, sure. So, um, so way back we had imagined, you know, when we were deeply in the into taking Yiddish classes and uh, in Yiddish circles, we had imagined that, of course, you know, one day we'd raise our family in Yiddish. But then we had, you know, been away from the Yiddish world, focused on other parts of life, um, and we, uh, when our first child was born, um, he was born early in July. And uh, we had, you know, not made summer vacation plans. We, we didn't know what to expect. We were just getting used to being parents. Um, but as late August rolled around, we thought, you know, it would be nice to go somewhere. Where could we go? And we remembered that there was this, um, this program 
called Yiddish Vach or Yiddish Week that we had visited once for like a day or two. And it was at this beautiful um, summer camp setting though they have like an adult um, adult retreat center areas where there are little motel like rooms and you know they serve three meals a day you didn't have to get out get in your car to go anywhere which was really an advantage because our first child hated being in the car he just screamed whenever he was awake if he was in the car so we figured look we could go for a week there would be three meals a day. We wouldn't have to get in the car. Um, and they speak Yiddish, great. Uh, <laughs> and it was within driving distance, it wasn't too far away. It was uh, just over the border in New York. Um, so we went, even though we hadn't been speaking Yiddish that much, but when you go to Yiddish Vok, you can't speak English anywhere that there are other people around. So, um, so we went and we, we figured, you know, we know enough to get by in that way. And the people there were so happy to see us. Um, we, had, we barely knew any of them, um, but they were so happy to see us and they were so happy that we had a baby. And they wanted to know all about us. And they said, well, of course you're raising him in Yiddish. And we said, well, we haven't spoken so much. We're rusty. I don't think we know enough Yiddish to raise a baby in Yiddish. But we were there for a week. And by the end of the week, um, we met many other people who were raising their children in Yiddish, even though they maybe didn't quite know enough Yiddish to be able to do it. And, and people were so sure that we were going to and so happy that we were there um, that by the end of the week, we were. <laughs> and so we, we spent the first seven weeks of his life spe speaking to him in English, but then after that, Yiddish. Um, and it turns out that in the first year um, of of baby's life, they don't really care what language you're speaking to them. They don't care whether your grammar is correct. They don't care whether your vocabulary is correct. They're really, they're really very forgiving. And so um, it turns out that a lot of the fluency that we've developed, we developed by actually just choosing to use the language um, and using it on a daily basis with our kids for the last 13 years or so. And um, in maybe just a moment, we'll show you a little bit of a video. Uh, so yeah, so this plays Yiddish Vach, uh, which is usually over the um, uh, over the border in New York. Though a few years it went to to Maryland before it came back, um, and that that really gives us like a shot in the arm each year because you know most of the time it's just just our immediate family speaking Yiddish. Occasionally, my father-in-law, um, you know, every once in a while, you know, somebody at Shul for a few minutes. But uh, for the most part, it's just us. So it's really amazing to you know, spend a week and see the kids you know, running around speaking Yiddish with each other and playing games together in Yiddish and sports together in Yiddish. Uh, and it also sort of helps us in our vocabulary and our grammar, which is occasionally suspect. Um, so I think I, I, we might not show the whole video, but we'll show you at least a little bit of uh, this video of Yiddish Vach. So this was from the 2014 version. Do you want to do the do thing you where you- do uh, the thing? Yeah. yeah. to share computer sound. Okay. Here it is. <laughs> Eine verschiedenartige Gruppe von über 150 Menschen ist sich zusammengekommen in Ryerstown, Maryland, beim Pearlstone Opus Center, Kedai zu verbringen eine Woche auf Jiddisch. Die Anteil nehmen es, in Alter von ein paar Kedoschen bis die tiefe 80 Jahren, sind gekommen von über ganz Amerika, wie euch von Holland, Schweden, Brasil, Mexiko, Litte, Polen, Russland und Israel. After high York of Yiddish. Just pointing out that's our son Velvel, I believe, in the big Yamaka over there. Spach, organized von Jungen Truff, Jungen Tver Yiddish, hat man gespielt verschiedene Sport, Spielereien, gehalten Referaten, gemacht Kunst, gesingen Lieder, in Stam genossen, von einem schönen Wetterleben Baltimore. Zwischen die Gäste, seinen Gewinn, 35 Kinder gingen von 14 Jahren. 
was haben Anteil genommen in die spezieller Kinderaktivitäten? Art seht ihr, wie die Kinder haben bei sich die Siegen auf dem Farm? Kedese lernen sich, wie soll mit Milch sein? Zwischen den populärsten Aktivitäten auf der Hajoriker Jiddischwoch ist gewähnt der Freigeschlag, ein jüdischen Nussach von College Ball, wo es ein Viertel und Gittelschächte wischen hat. Wer ist gewähnt der erste Präsident von Amerika, wo es geboren wurde in einem 20. Jahrhundert? Does anybody know the answer? This is partially funny because several of those people are not Americans. Um, the ones you're looking at are from Israel and Mexico, I believe. <laughs> oh. And several are. John F. Kennedy is Okay, so maybe we'll come back out of the uh, video there. There's a few more minutes, but that's probably a good taste. And um, do you know where everything else went over there? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, and I was I was on that uh, uh, college ball team that I don't think I got any answers correct. And the woman who was the uh, the leader of the game show is now the uh, or she, or she's the uh, editor of this amazing uh, Yiddish English dictionary that was based on the work of her father. Uh, Mordechai Schechter, who was a Yiddish professor, uh, he was uh, he and his family were really the like progenitors of this young Yiddish movement um, and the idea of raising your kids uh, speaking Yiddish even in America. And uh, to this day, there's usually a good twenty-ish um, of the clan that that make up the Yiddish Vach group each year, including one of them um, who was the um, the translator of Harry Potter into Yiddish. And at the time that he chose to, that he and his wife chose to raise their kids in Yiddish, this is the same moment that um, many of the many of the people in our families were choosing not to raise their families in Yiddish, to speak Yiddish as their secret language um, and to speak English with their children. So it was he was sort of bucking the trend, and uh, and it's paid off. He's got, you know. Y Yiddish speaking grandchildren and great grandchildren and and this whole um, movement that's grown up around them. And we do the opposite. We speak Yiddish so that our parents can't understand. So after after a few years of raising the kids in Yiddish and hearing it, they they they're they're, they're all pretty good at understanding by now. There was actually a, a while where um, where we would speak to our kids in Yiddish and then they would translate for my mother or um, who by that point. Under, she understood plenty of Yiddish enough, especially of what we would say to the kids that uh, she didn't need the translation, but she always, uh, always appreciated it. They, they stopped translating by now, but <laughs> they did then. So maybe we'll say a few more words about raising the kids in Yiddish and then go to some other Yiddish resources. Um, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so raising kids in Yiddish has been an interesting adventure, um, starting with that initial sense of can we do it even do we have enough um, enough resources to do it um, a lot of the time people ask us well why um, and other than that we showed up at this place and they thought that we would and we didn't want to disappoint them um, we actually thought at first about you know maybe one of us would want to speak um, Yiddish with the kids and maybe one would speak Hebrew um, and we decided uh, that considering that neither of us was 100% comfortable in either Yiddish or Hebrew, um, that to do it as a team effort would be the way to go. And we decided Hebrew, they were, they were likely to get um, in other places, right? They learn Hebrew in school and having the experience of being bilingual from birth um, to pick up the next language it certainly takes work, um, but they've been able to pick up other languages quite quickly. Um, I would say 
one of the more difficult moments of, of raising children is in Yiddish is the moment that time before they speak back to you when I would find myself, you know, walking down the aisle in a grocery store, speaking to a child in a language that nobody around us understood, um, to a child who clearly wasn't going to answer. Um, and there's a certain sense of uh, discomfort there. Um, for a while, um, some of our parents felt like a little bit left out if, while we were speaking to the kids in Yiddish, if they didn't understand what we were saying. Um, and that, in those ways, it was a little bit uncomfortable at times. Um, but knowing that they're only going to learn if we speak to them, um, we sort of pushed through those uncomfortable moments. And uh, and lo and behold, the kids lear learned Yiddish right along with English. Um, all along, they've had um, a good amount of contact with their grandparents and seen them regularly. So they were learning Yiddish, for, learning English from their grandparents, learning Yiddish from us. Um, and, and using them, using them both, um, pretty much all along. Um, our kids have never been, um, very rebellious about language. They, uh, they occasionally fall into speaking English between one another. Um, they often speak Yiddish between themselves. And, uh, if, if we find them, you know, fighting or arguing about something, often the first thing we'll say is, you know, first of all, speak, argue in Yiddish, and secondly, you know, cut it out. <laughs> um, and they're usually happy to oblige and switch back into Yiddish. And I'll just add that uh, we told uh, our oldest one, who's a real rule follower, you know, when he had his, uh, his brother was born a couple of years later, you know, we told him that it was like part of his responsibility to make sure that his little brother would learn Yiddish. And then when they had another little brother a few years later, they, they both took it upon themselves to, you know, to be their teachers and exemplars for their, for their brother. So um, uh, they really, you know, taken it on seriously and, uh, you know, made it a family project. And at any moment when they've seemed likely to, um, to use English more than we'd like them to, we've also been able to mention to them, well, if you don't speak Yiddish, then we're not going to be able to go to Yiddish book. And they've, um, they've always looked forward to going back in the summers to, um, to be in this beautiful place and also to pick up those relationships with friends. And we've pretty much only spoken to them in Yiddish, like pretty much their whole lives, unless we were reading to them a book in English and not trying to translate on the spot. Um, and uh, that's just kind of like how it's been. Uh, so, so it's a little weird, but um, but like wonderful also. And uh, one of my favorite moments is you know just uh, bedtime. We still have the boys, all three of them, sleeping in the same room, and uh, we you know I read them uh, something in Yiddish every night. You know sometimes it's like a real Yiddish book. You know something from Shalom Aleichem. We're reading um, Motel Pesim, the, the Mechazan's uh, son. Uh, now, uh, but we we've read. Um, you know, uh, you know, The Hobbit in Yiddish uh, with a, a recent translation and um, Treasure Island and uh, Winnie the Pooh and, and other, um, and other um, works both originally in Yiddish and not originally in Yiddish. Um, we thought we would briefly show you um, some Yiddish resources out there. Um, let's see here, do you, you mind doing the sharing thing again? Sure. Okay. Um, so besides the amazing Yiddish Book Center, um, there's the, uh, the Yiddish Forverts, the, uh, the Yiddish newspaper, which is now, uh, completely online. So is this being shared? Yeah, that's being shared. Should I make it bigger? Or does sure. that make a difference? I don't know. Okay. Um, can, can everyone see that? Okay. Okay. So this is the, um, website of, of the Yiddish Forverts, um, which used to be a daily, uh, printed paper and is now all online. Uh, there's Yiddish crossword puzzles. There's a great Yiddish word of the day series. Uh, and there's a great Yiddish cooking series, as well as, you know, songs and interviews and other things. Uh, if you're looking at an article, you can click on any word and it translates for you. Uh, I think I'll show you just a little bit of um, Eskiz Interhate, which is a Yiddish cooking program. Uh, this one is live from the Yiddish farm, um, which is a place in Goshen, New York, uh, which is dedicated to both organic farming and uh, teaching Yiddish. Uh, so maybe we'll show you just a little bit of this one here. If I press play, will that work? It you will think? play, yes. Shalom Aleichem. Echt een zullen dat gezegd, hè? Richting Idiot. 
activists died by Christe in the Kopfmagran asking in the hate of Yiddish farm in Goshen, New York. Is near the undo via day with a plans to outstain their Yiddish Rendeke farmer. When outstain is organic, out is organic. The children are in Yiddish. And we will not find an Emerse, Koyish, or Organish Seder. A one hand, Ned Berke Salar, the Dorf Sein. I will have Kochen the Berke Blätter with Knobel and with a bit of Spinat. Yeah, in Knobel Groit. And out have me a one of the farmer, Yisro Vas. What has he got in the hand? Do all the fish and Knobel with a hack and him and the Schwarz to add. Goshen is an orange county, New York. Well, there again, it is very very far Schwarze Erde. Schwarze Erde is the best of Sibylus and Knobel. Okay, so we're gonna. Whoops, how do I get? Uh, oh, oh, this is okay. <laughs> um, Stop sharing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so okay. that was the beginning of a Yiddish cooking show. They usually do more cooking, but uh... <laughs> yeah, they get they get to cooking later in that one, and and usually they do all cooking, and it's great. It's it's both a great way to learn some Yiddish, and they're like fun people anyway. One of them is now the uh, editor of the Yiddish Forverts. The other one is like a great Yiddish cook. And uh, also the recipes are always delicious. We've made a few of them. Um, okay, good, we stopped sharing, right? We did, yeah. Okay. And Eve has a great Yiddish food blog as well that, uh, that has lots of nice recipes in both Yiddish and English. Um, locally here, a great Yiddish, Yiddish resource is the Workman's Circle or Worker's Circle, I think it's called now, the Arbiter Ring. And uh, they have Yiddish programs, including uh, monthly schmoozes. And there's a monthly sing-along that we never got to go to when it was uh, live in person in Brookline, because that was always at bedtime. Uh, but during the, these COVID times, we've been going every, every month and helping to lead a few songs. So that's been um, a pleasure for now us. Now that it's on Zoom. Now that it's on Zoom. Um, so we thought we might share a little bit of music with you. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm a, a cantor and play the violin mostly. And Shira is, besides being a rabbi, plays the accordion and we both sing. Our kids uh, sing and also play uh, violin, trombone and not quite the piano. Um, and our son uh, celebrated his bar mitzvah on Zoom over the summer. And for his uh, mitzvah project, which he's uh, continuing uh, now, though more slowly than before his bar mitzvah, uh, he produced a series of concerts. He had, his original plan was to go visit you know, local nursing homes and assisted livings and uh, do concerts for the residents there, uh, playing the violin and singing. And then right about the time he was about to start was the time that COVID really hit us. Uh, so he adapted his mitzvah project to make it online instead. So this is his series that he called Mitzvah Melodies. So maybe we'll show you um, we'll show you one song uh, from like the beginning of, of a broadcast of his, and then we'll show you another one in a minute. So that's concert number eight. Let's see here. Mitzvah yeah. Melodies eight. Okay. Oh, we have to share again. Share again. Okay. There it is. You want to play from here? Sure. Okay. Hello, my name is Zalman Richmond Shazir. I'm 12, almost 13 years old, and a seventh going to eighth grader at Metro West Jewish Day School. This is the eighth concert in a series of mini concerts that I'm sending as part of my mitzvah project. I hope you enjoy. For the first song, we're going to sing Lomer Ala Zingin, which means let's all sing. And the words are based on a Shabbat Zmira, a Shabbat table song, uh, which mentions four things. Uh, lechem, Basar, Dogim, and Matamim, which means bread, meat, fish, and yummy things. 
And this, and in the song, different people ask Zalman uh, what these things are. So, usually in the song, they ask the Rebbe the questions. Usually they ask the the, the tata, tata, the tata, tata. Yeah. Okay, but we're gonna ask Zalman. Zalman gives two answers, both for the rich people and for anyone else. And for the last question, what is matamim or yummy things? Zalman answers, uh, for the rich, they have a uh, compote, but for everyone else, and here's the punchline, uh, they have chopped trouble. And I'm not sure how funny that actually is, but. So I think we had uh, one or two more songs we might play for you, but uh, we thought maybe we'd pause for questions first. Uh, I don't know if you want to put them in the chat or... Um... I guess if, if people have a question and can raise their hand or, or unmute themselves or mm -hmm. chat, either way. Yep. Anybody we can only see some of the Yeah, people. we can't see you all at once. Yeah, so if you're raising your hand, we might not see you. Right, exactly. Or if you want, maybe we could play you one more song and you could, if you think of questions, you can either put them in the chat or um, figure out another way to pass them on. Um, so maybe we'll play you uh, a la breeder, which is, um, I, I forget if Zalman introduces it or not. Uh, he probably does. Well, that's concert number five, I think. What's that one there? Is that it? Uh, yes. Okay. So this is it. And he'll probably, uh, he probably introduces it fine. Okay. We'll does. pause it otherwise. So we need to do sharing again. Oh, we need to do sharing. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, hold on a sec. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is one more from the Mitzvah Melodies series. We're going to sing Ale Breeder, which means uh, we're all brothers. And of course, I couldn't do that without all the brothers. Um, this, this is also the world premiere of my mom's recent new verse. I am sorry. <laughs> Maybe we'll translate the new exciting verse too. Do you remember what it says? Oh, I'm, we might have translated it on the screen. Oh, you we? think we did? Maybe we did. Okay, we'll find out. I think we did. Okay. <laughs> Should have said like no one else. <laughs> By the way, we um, we uh, almost never say Kugel. We always say Kiggle, but we had to rhyme with Google. So uh, it came out Kugel that time. 
Let's see, we're just making it so we can see you again. So that was great. Um, Bravo, that was wonderful. Huh, our synagogue sings Baruch to that tune. Huh. huh, very nice. This is not what happens in my house. So I'm very <laughs> impressed. I have a question. Go ahead, Lloyd. Hi, oh, hi Lloyd, nice Jerry to see you. Kenny. How are you? Yeah, nice to see you. Do you sell the videos? Uh, it's all available on for free on YouTube. Um, let's see here. We could probably get you a link to the series. Yes. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll post something in the chat there. Um, this is one of the videos and I think if you look at this one, you can see the um, all the other ones like on the side. I think we were planning to make it public, but didn't do it yet. But um, that's the link over there. Thank you. It looks like uh, Abraham has a question and then maybe Minna after that. You wanna unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. I think as mir muss nach Halle a stark okay. compliment came. Can we ask the question? I think we have to give you all, both of you, a very strong compliment. You know, Zeugen geworden and Yiddish is gewesen mein big star. No, not you. Say what? Okay, Abraham, you have to translate for some of okay. us. Okay, <laughs> I was brought up where Yiddish was a cradle tongue. And so I spoke no English until age five and a half when I went into kindergarten. But nevertheless, I became a language major in college mm -hmm. and Yiddish represented the, the, the kind of uh, basis for which everything else came in. And uh, I want to tell you that your efforts on, the, on behalf of your children and their future education is such a remarkable thing that I must compliment you very strongly because it's going to be great because you've taught them what you've taught them. And I, I admire the fact that both of you apparently died in the wool, Massachusetts Americans, nevertheless, are uh, uh, willing and able to make your kids that much more bankable as human beings. <laughs> okay, thank you, Abraham. I'm gonna yeah. let- um, I have to Minna? Condone. thank you. Minna, go ahead, you're on. Yeah. Yeah, Hi. We, we unfortunately missed the beginning of the program, so you may have answered this already, but do you speak Yiddish? Did you grow up in homes where they spoke Yiddish at home? So we talked about the little of the beginning. Um, neither of us got fluent Yiddish as kids, but uh, we each heard a little bit. Um, I heard my dad used to speak a little bit in Yiddish to us some of the time, um, and, and Ken heard from his grandparents. The, now, when you say kiggle instead of kugel, are, are you Galicianos? Yeah, so we, we have mostly taken on the, um, the dialect of my grandmother, who is uh, our probably strongest Yiddish influence. Um, though I'm sure she, if she were around, she would tell us that we were doing it wrong. <laughs> no, you're doing it right. This is the King's Yiddish. Um, <laughs> King's Yiddish. Where was your grandmother from? She was from Southwest Poland, uh, a town called Benjin. My father spent the, the uh, years just before the Second World War in Benjin. Oh, wow. makes you oh I know relative. this, you're a landslide. Or a landsman, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we went back with her to Benjin uh, in the year 2000. 2000. Yeah, oh, it, it, was, it was her ago. first time back there since the war. And she, she found the apartment that she, she used to live in. It still had the, the sukkah between like two apartments. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, bitters, bittersweet. Uh, well, we, we, you made us quell. Uh, you have very <laughs> talented kids who uh, not only can speak Yiddish, but have lovely voices and are very cute and photogenic. So okay. we enjoyed. Thank you. Just wondering, where is the Richmond family from? Um, let's see. We're, uh, we're a Gamesh. You're sort of a mixture. Um, my grandfather was born in Ukraine. He was the only one that was born out of the country. And we're, we're sort of like 50-50 between Litvaks and Galicianers. Okay. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little mixed up. And then when you learn uh, Yiddish in classes, it's sort of a, a klal Yiddish, a general Yiddish, which is 
closest to Litvak, but not exactly. So uh, there was a while when Shira was speaking with one accent and I would speak with another accent and the kids would notice who spoke which way. <laughs> or, or sometimes if we looked up a word we didn't know in, in the in the Wörterbuch and the um, dictionary, uh, Shira would pick like one word that she thought was a more fun to way to say something and I would pick the other one and and uh, and the kids would always like know, oh, Tata says this and Mama says that. Can you explain the Litvak and Galiziana for some people? I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. So um, in what once could have been called Yiddish land, there were different regions. Um, Litvak more or less means Lithuanian, though it doesn't line up exactly with uh, the current borders of Lithuania. Um, Galiziana is like a, a section of Poland. There are actually um, variations even among those um, dialects. There's sort of there are sort of three main dialects. There's the Litvish Yiddish, the um, Polish Yiddish, or Polish Yiddish, and there's Central Yiddish um, that was sort of Ukraine and and other areas, um, and and wide variation even among those. Great. So we have time for a, one more question. Anybody wants to unmute yourselves because we can't see you. Okay. Well, I want to thank Ken and Shira for a, a lovely uh, evening. We really, uh, I think, enjoyed and learned a lot about raising a family in 2020 speaking Yiddish. And your kids have great accents. So uh, uh, it was wonderful to hear. Um, and I just want to, uh, before we end, um, I'm not a great sharer of screens, so I'm not going to do some things tonight, but I, I just want to tell you of some things to come. Um, so in a couple of weeks, uh, November 12th, our cantor Elias Rosenberg is going to do um, explore the Yiddish music with us. So I hope uh, everybody will come back. And um, ah, you've been thanked, a shame and dunk. I know that one too. Uh, so I came from a family where they spoke Yiddish so that we didn't understand what they were saying. And I'm very good at swearing and um, understanding, uh, which is what I understand is true for many people. Um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, I, as I said at the beginning that Yiddish is blowing up. Um, J Arts, the Jewish Arts Association um, is doing a, an evening um, of a Bintel brief um, on November 11th, I'll send this to, to people tomorrow. Um, you can sign up, it's free. Uh, it's a reading of um, a Yiddish advice column that started in the early, early 20th century by Abraham Kahan, who was the editor of the Forvitz. The Forvitz now comes also in, Yidd in English. I get a daily um, uh, email from people from the, the forward with, uh, and they have links to the Yiddish, but mostly in, in English. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, they're doing this together with uh, the Schusterman Center uh, at Brandeis and Jonathan Sarna is gonna be doing an introduction. So I just think it will be a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, Arnie Glick is on the, the screen here in front of me um, and we didn't have time. Hopefully I can, maybe I can share one if I do this correctly, right, Shira? Um, I'm gonna show you, can you guys see this? Hold on, all right. So Arnie is a member of the temple and people are seeing this. He is um, a lawyer by day and a cartoonist by love, I guess. And he runs, he does a, um, a, a series called Schmoozen and he often uses Yiddish words. So here's the fish. I brought the whole mishpacha. Um, and let's see if I can do more of this. Uh, hmm. Well, like I said, I'm not an expert and I seem to have lost it. So, uh, nope. Anyway, there are more. Um, Arnie, uh, if you, you want to unmute and say a few words, that would be lovely. Um, but we'll show you more of his Yiddish cartoons another time. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and especially our speakers. Uh, Krista and Ken and Shira. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening. So uh, thank you for coming. I get the nach, the shinam dank. Great to see you all. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you all.
Thank you. Good Wonderful. Night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.